Garage, Garage, Software Crisis Hotline, State Your Emergency. Yeah, fast and square root. Uh huh. Uh huh. And how fast was it going when I passed you? It's faster than we thought. Hey, I'm Dave. Welcome to my shop. I'm Dave Plummer, a retired operating systems engineer from Microsoft, going back to the MS-DOS and Windows 95 days. And today, we're wrapping up the story of the amazing fast inverse square root algorithm that was discovered in the Quake 3 Arena source code when that game's code was released to the public back in 2005. We'll find out precisely just how fast it is later in the episode when we heads up Drag Race four variations of inverse square root in a sudden death, no holds barred cage match of inverse square root fury. Watch all your favorites such as C Runtime and SSE Intrinsic as they battle the Pfizer and a classically optimized integer version for the ultimate in square root speed supremacy. So what did we learn last episode? What did you miss if you haven't seen it? Go back and watch it. This one will make a lot more sense if you haven't seen the first part. But in brief, we covered how everything in computer graphics is really based around processing mathematical vectors. And we looked at how to normalize vectors to make their length one without changing their direction. In so doing, we learned that the fundamental operation we need to perform is to divide each of the x, y, and z components by the vector's overall magnitude or length. Because in America, first you normalize the vectors, then you get the money, and then you get the power. And well, you know the rest of that one. The Quake 3 Arena Pfizer, or Fast Inverse Square Root, is a confounding, confusing, and complicated algorithm that solves square roots in a few steps with no loops and no branches. In its code, we can see that it twice does what is actually an undefined operation in C. It takes the raw storage data for an IEEE 754 floating point number and converts it directly to a long value and then just starts using it. It later stuffs the resulting bits back into the floating point memory slot as though that were all perfectly normal too, although it's most certainly anything but. We ran out of time last episode, which means we have a few items to wrap up today, and those are, how does the floating point to integer and back part of the algorithm actually work and why? Who is ultimately responsible for the algorithm, the magic constant in it, and where did it all come from? And finally, just how fast is the Pfizer algorithm in real life testing? We'll cover all three points in today's episode. To test the speed, I've written a benchmark that does billions of inverse square roots per second to compare four different approaches. The first is the compiler's provided square root function. Next is the intrinsic for the estimated reciprocal square root instruction that's now being built into the processor's specialized floating point units. Third is an optimized C version of an integer square root. And finally, we have the Quake 3 Pfizer itself. After all, we have the actual source code to it, so why not put it to the test? If you're a fan of this channel, then you've no doubt seen the fastest computer language drag racing series, where we test the speed of most every computer language ever invented. If not, it's my most popular series, so please do make sure you check it out next. To compare the speed of the languages, we rely on prime number benchmarks submitted by the community and then operated by our tame racing programmer, the stack. Some say he codes with just the ones and doesn't even need the zeros, and others say he's the illegitimate love child of Grace Hopper and Ray Nurda. All we know is that he's called the stack and he does all the code racing for us. Predictably, those fancy charts and graphs are coming up later in the episode. In the code, we see a float get stuffed into an integer, operated on as if it were meaningful to do so, and then the result is stuffed back into a float. And I'll tell you right up front, that doesn't work, at least it's not the way you think it might. To appreciate why that is, we need to understand what a floating point number is and how it's stored and manipulated. Then will not only get a sense for how alien the notion of smashing the bits back and forth is, but we'll be able to appreciate how and why they're actually doing it. A normal 32-bit integer is stored in memory, much as I suspect you think it is. Imagine the lowest bit on the far right. It has a value of 1 if it's set. Moving left, each bit position doubles in value. 2, 4, 8, 16, and so on. The topmost bit, however, is reserved as a sign bit. When it's 0, that means the number is positive. When it's 1, the number is negative. Yes, you there, in the front row? Ah, the smart kid wants to know why it handles having both a positive and negative zero. Are they equal when all the bits are zero even if the sign bit is different? Well, the trick is that almost all modern computers use a binary representation known as two's complement. When the sign bit is set, you obtain the real value by negating all the other bits and adding one. I don't want to drift too far out of our lane with the how and why, but it avoids having two representations for zero and it means you can take full advantage of the full range of numbers. For example, 
In an 8-bit value, if you just used a naive sign bit, you'd then have the range from negative 127 to positive 127, but that's only 255 values. With 2's complement, the values start at negative 128 and run up to the same positive 127, so you get all 256 values to make use of. Better yet, addition and subtraction can be performed blindly without worrying about the sign bit, and it all pretty much just works. When we last left Floating Point, we learned that Bill Gates and Paul Allen hired a Harvard guy named Monty Davidoff to write the Floating Point implementation for their Altair Basic. It was completely up to him to pick a format and figure out how to do it, and the format he came up with is quite like what is now enshrined as the official spec in IEEE Standard 754. Rather than speculate, I directly asked Monty where he got his inspiration. The story he told me updates the commonly held history with an important new detail as well. Monty never actually had written a floating point implementation before. As I've done so many times in my own life, when an opportunity presented itself, he eagerly pledged to do something he knew he would have to figure out how to do later. Here he is in his own words. I learned about floating point from the implementation of the focal language on a PDP-8. I disassembled it by hand to understand how it worked. I had not actually implemented floating point before the 8080 basic. My claim to Bill Gates that I had was a bit of an exaggeration. I understood it well enough that I was confident I could do it. At the time I was writing the 8080 floating point, I did not have any access to any of the PDP-8 focal material. Thus, Monty learned how to do floating point from his experience with focal on the PDP-8, but he didn't refer directly to it while writing his own. He recalls his disassembly as being done sometime in 1972 or 73, which would be a number of years prior to his work on the Altair Basic. Now, if Monty's floating point was inspired by the focal language, where did focal come from? Since it all came out of digital equipment, I first tried Dave Cutler himself, who pointed me at fellow deck alumnus Richard Larry. Mr. Larry was also the author of a 1970s basic interpreter that had floating point support. He told me that a fellow named Rick Merrill was the sole creator of focal, but the floating point format likely didn't start with him either. In fact, it likely all goes back to the system math routines on the PDP-8 itself, and Richard kindly sent me a copy of the PDP-8 floating point manual from DEC itself, which is dated back to 1968, the year of my birth. I traced the lineage of those routines arguably back to the PDP-5 floating point package. There's somewhat of an update of those. Thus, the Quake 3 Pfizer is dependent on IEEE 754, which was the standardized replacement for Microsoft binary format, which was designed by Monty Davidoff, based on having seen the focal language by Rick Merrill, which in turn was likely inspired by the PDP-8 floating point package that was an update of the PDP-5 code from the early 1960s. But who wrote the PDP-5 or PDP-8 code? Well, I've made some calls and I'm working on it, but for now, that's the end of the line. If I find out, I'll be sure to let you know in a future video, so if you're curious for more history, do make sure you're subscribed to the channel. Now that we know the lineage of this vaunted floating point format, what is it? How does it work? How do computers internally represent fractional numbers with decimal points in them when all they have to work with is whole binary numbers? Now, if I were new at this and you asked me how to represent floating point decimal numbers on a processor that deals exclusively with integers, I might decide that 8 bits of precision after the decimal point is good enough for me. So I'd break up a 32-bit word into a 24-bit section of whole numbers known as the mantissa, and the other 8 bits would represent the fraction after the decimal point. Remember, we're actually in binary, so our bits after the decimal point are fractions of powers of 2. In other words, after the decimal point, we have the digits worth 1 half, 1 quarter, 1 eighth, 1 sixteenth, and so on. You make up whatever number you need by combining those fractional bits to get as close as possible to the base 10 number that you're trying to represent. The 24-bit mantissa is then just a normal integer number. To represent the number 10.75, we place 10 in the mantissa and the bits for 1 half and 1 quarter in the fractional section, making it 0.75. Taken together, it's 10.75. There are a few problems with this approach. First off, it's not a floating point system at all, it's a fixed point, locked at a fraction size of 8 bits. Second, we've lost much of the number's range, as with only 24 bits, it now tops out around 16 million. A much better system would be to represent everything in scientific notation with a fraction and an exponent. That way, the precision is always the same no matter where the decimal point is. We shift the decimal place and update the exponent until our mantissa is between 0 and 1. Our 10.75 number would then become 0 0.1075 times 10 to the second power. To represent this, we would put 1075 in the mantissa and 2 in the exponent. We're going to want to be able to deal with negative numbers as well, so we'll need a sign bit up top. The next question is how many bits should we allocate to the exponent? We use 8, which, as we learned, gives us the range negative 128 to positive 127. 
Now, these are powers of 2, not 10. But 2 to the 127 still works out to 10 followed by 38 zeros in base 10, plenty big for most 32-bit purposes. That leaves us 23 bits for the fraction. Thus, we have 1 sign bit, 8 exponent bits, and 23 fraction bits. Doesn't matter how big your number is, you get 23 bits of precision independent of the exponent. Now, there are only two nuances you really need to learn from there. The first is that we always shift the fraction left to get rid of any leading zeros, adjusting the exponent by 1 each time we do so, of course. The value stays the same, but in so doing, we always have a 1 in the topmost bit of the fraction. And in one of the cleverer moments of computer science, somebody realized that if it's always 1, why not just make it implicit, throw it away, and you gain one more bit of precision, seemingly, for free. I always thought that was pretty genius. However, it's not magic or cheating. That information of where the topmost bit lives is fully preserved in the exponent information. It's just eliminating redundancy. Now, it's not used by the Pfizer, but if you're curious, a double precision floating point is also available at 64 bits. It carries a sign bit, 11 exponent bits, and 52 fractional bits. That's a huge amount of range and precision. With an exponent up to 2 to the 10 23rd power, its range works out to 10 to the 307th. Last I counted, there were only 10 to the 80 particles in the universe, so let's call it jumbo for sure. Now that you have a general idea how a floating point number is represented, I should clarify that when I was speaking about the lineage of the format earlier, I don't mean that it remained entirely identical across the ages. A few viewers pointed out that I was playing a little fast and loose with the precise details as I quickly wrapped up the previous episode, which is true. But the basics of it, the sine bit, the 8-bit biased exponent, and the 23-bit fraction are all there in general going back to the PDP-8. MBF and IEEE 754 are not the same. The bias is one different, so that's just one reason they aren't directly binary compatible, but they're at least cousins. Whether reinvented multiple times or by direct inspiration, many other formats, like that of the venerable IBM 360 mainframe, are also quite similar in their layout. And so now that you've seen how a floating point number is stored in a register in memory, you can appreciate how little sense it makes for the Pfizer algorithm to interchange raw floating point data with integer numbers. When the Pfizer first extracts the integer value of the floating point number, remember that the exponent is up there, and any bits that were turned on in the exponent will now be high bits set in the integer value. But that's the least of our problems. Remember the step of shifting everything left all the way? That means that any bits set in the fraction are likely way up top. I don't think it'll ever be intuitively obvious to me what precisely happens when you smash bits back and forth between floating point and integer formats, at least in terms of the impact it has on the value of the number and why. Even if that's never clear, there is, however, as they say online, one weird trick you absolutely must know. And that is that when you do that process of aliasing an IEEE 754 floating point number as an integer, you get an important side effect. It yields something very close to the log 2 of x for small x. Once we have the log 2, we can use it to help solve the square root using various identities. The resulting value is perfect at 0 and 1, and then for numbers in between, it's simply scaled and offset. But given that's the case, we can fix that by removing the offset and scale. We just need to know how much to do so by. It turns out that once you've done that floating point to integer aliasing, you can fix up the scale and offset by subtracting half of your result from a starting point. And that starting point is the magical constant 5F3759DF. Here's a graph of the results, and as you can see, it's impressively accurate for solving everything without a single branch or loop. As to how that magic constant is derived, I'll show you a bit of the math. Now, if you look at the top right-hand corner, you'll see the most important number, which is 9. That's the page number, and that means this is the ninth page of this stuff. So I'll include a link to this paper in the video description, but here's the thing. After all that, they come up with a different number, and no one actually seems to know how the Pfizer constant was discovered originally. People have now literally tried every possible 32-bit number exhaustively, and it was proved to be the best. But who did it originally? At the time, with it being made famous by the release of the Quake 3 Arena code, most people assumed that John Carmack was responsible. When finally somebody thought to actually press him on it, though, he demurred that, in fact, it was not his, but perhaps it could have been Terhe Matheson's. And my Scandinavian ancestors are rolling in their graves, as I am sure my pronunciation is wildly off, so I'll stick with Mr. Matheson from here on out. Mr. Matheson is one of the very few people that might challenge Michael Abrash when it comes to hand-optimizing x86 assembly. If his name isn't quite a household word, you might know him best as one of the folks that did the public analysis of the Pentium FDiv bug. He chimed in on the comment section of the first episode, so if you've got math questions about the Pfizer that are way above my pay grade, perhaps he'll spot it if you ask nicely in the comments here. It turned out that Mr. Matheson had indeed written something similar for a computational fluid chemistry problem. In his case, however, he started with a lookup table followed by a Newtonian approach, as we discussed in the first part. 
But according to a thread at the Beyond 3D website, the trail leads from there to NVIDIA and to a Gary Taroli, one of the original founders of 3DFX. When he was showing the Pfizer, he called it a pretty great piece of code, but as to why the magic cost that works, even he could not recall. It wasn't originally his. He was familiar with it and had apparently done an implementation of it for the SGI Indigo that may have influenced the final form of the Pfizer and Quake, but he was not prepared to take credit as its creator. From there, the trail went largely cold until an article on Slashdot brought the original author forward on their own. His name is Greg Walsh, and his resume goes back to include things like the first WYSIWYG word processor at Xerox Park while he was at Stanford. At the time, Greg was working with Cleve Moeller, perhaps best known to us as the author of MATLAB and the founder and chief scientist at MathWorks. Greg says he took his initial seat of inspiration from Cleve. To date, no one has put a firm stake into the ground as to precisely how, but as best we can determine today, Greg Walsh was the author and the magic constant came out of a collaboration between himself and Cleve Moeller. Lest you think it perhaps handed down to him by divine inspiration or perhaps aliens, rest assured that even the Pfizer algorithm isn't quite perfect, however. There's some room for small improvement in the constants used by the Newtonian iteration. And Mr. Matheson also identified a different constant that gives you a better first approximation, but that it gets worse on the second Newtonian iteration, which I don't fully get. But as far as we know, the magic constant, the original one, is still the best on the first iteration. The last question we want to ask ourselves is, with all the glorious ability of modern CPUs and GPUs, is the Pfizer algorithm even still relevant? The answer to that must be answered by testing its performance. And that's why I developed a C++ benchmark to test four variations of inverse square root, including the Pfizer. We'll race them heads up for a billion iterations and see which is the fastest. I've kept the benchmark as simple as I could. First, it calls each of the four methods to calculate the square root of a million and hope it comes out at a thousand. And sure enough, of course, each one passes the test. Now, the Pfizer actually returns 998, not 1,000. That's well under 1% 1 error, but if it bothers you, we can uncomment that second line of Newtonian refinement in the Pfizer code. Its speed is a little changed, but the accuracy improves significantly, such that it then confidently returns 1,000. Once each method is shown to work properly, we call it repeatedly as fast as possible for 5 seconds, and we count how many million passes we can make per second. There are four functions here, and each one measures a different approach. The first, count divisions, just uses the square root function from the compiler. The next, count i divisions, calls the integer square root implementation. The third, count fi divisions, uses the Pfizer. And the final one, count interdivisions, uses the specialized AMD Intel SIMD FPU instruction intended specifically for this purpose. It returns an estimate of the reciprocal square root. If you're ready, I'll hand the keys to the stack here and he'll take each one for a test drive and report back with the results. I don't think there are too many surprises here, except I was impressed by both the Pfizer itself and especially the new R square root instruction. The integer square root is the slowest by far, coming in at 111 million operations per second. But wait, there's more to the story, because today, Intel chips for actually 20 years now have had the streaming SIMD or SSE instructions, because these were added by Intel around the year 2000 to enhance graphics capabilities and as a response to AMD's 3D Now architecture. SSE includes an instruction specifically to estimate the reciprocal square root of a number, just as we need. It renders the older methods largely obsolete. As you can see, it turns in nearly 4 billion operations per second. And that's with us wasting resources by only actually using 32 bits of the register's 128-bit width. What we don't know, however, is whether Intel used the Pfizer approach or something similar to it in the microcode to the reciprocal square root instruction. Perhaps it lives on in silicon, or perhaps the Pfizer is now entirely a historical curiosity. Only the chip engineers can know for sure. In the 80s and 90s, when it was conceived, however, it was revolutionary in its speed, coming in almost 30 times faster than our optimized integer square root. The Pfizer, then, is something like an Amiga computer, way ahead of its time, but long, long ago. I hope you enjoyed this random tale of old code as much as I enjoyed bringing it to you. If you did find it interesting, educational, or even just enjoyable, please consider subscribing to my channel so that you can get more like it. And if you consider leaving me a like on the video, I'd sure appreciate that as well. If you have feedback on this video or topic suggestions for a future episode, please let me know in the video comments. This video came about directly as a suggestion from a subscriber named Brandon, and I'm always eager to know what it is that you'd like to know more about. Thanks for joining me out here in the shop today.
In the meantime and in between time, I hope to see you next time right here at Dave's Garage.